Hello, everyone. Just one second while I do a little thing here. Well, day 40 of our online knowledge sharing for practitioners. It's hosted here on Meta Knowledge and being broadcast from Vancouver, BC. For those of you that are new today, my name is John and I'll be your host. And we also have Dylan from Net of Knowledge here as a co-host and he'll join us from time to time. So these are exciting times, um, like the old Chinese curse that says, may you live in exciting times. Uh, well, that's where we're at. And um, we're at this gradual return to work situation here in Canada. Clinics are opening or are open now and are starting um, to, to, to move forward. And there was a headline I read today, and I wanted to share that with you. It said, we are now in the pandemic paradox. And um, the, par the, the heading um, said, Canadians are asked to go out and face the threat that kept them inside for weeks. And uh, so the article goes on to talk about, will people feel safe to overcome their fear and return to some form of regular life? And what came to mind for me was TCM to the rescue because we have Yang Shen, the whole art of cultivating life. And um, I want to ask you guys, do you have a Yang Shen cultivating life program that you can take your patients through? Something like eight to 10 sessions with outcome goals, like uh, increased energy by the end of the eight to 10 sessions, um, weight loss, um, better fitness, um, better uh, lifestyle practices, regular herb usages, and so on. I'm thinking to myself, if you don't have one, um, this would be the time to pull one together. Take all the teachings that you've learned over the years, sit down and plan out a, a course, a training program, because we are life educators, because our system of medicine is based on the principles of life. This would be the uh, opportunity to actually fulfill our destinies as health optimizers really that's that's our um that's our goal really and that's what sets us apart from other health professionals so plan out your yang shen training program go out there and create new and confident robust people who are no longer afraid of viruses and bacteria in the world and will stop using all those super strong bleaches and things to clean things so maybe your yang shen program will include auricular therapy, which is today's topic. And I know we've all been introduced to auricular therapy and some of us may be new to it, uh, but most of us have some basic knowledge and others may have a lot of knowledge. I know some of you out there do. But you know, each teacher brings something different to the knowledge base of learning. And as I mentioned before, there's always a gem or two that is a takeaway from these talks. And I'm sure that whether you're the beginner or whether you're an advanced person, there will be definitely some gems received here today. Our speaker today is Dr. Truth Sayer. And I checked and no, there is no first name or last name, just one name, and her name is Truth Sayer. Of course, I'm a curious person, so I asked her if it was okay to ask her about her name, and she was completely fine to share her story. And maybe at some point today, she may share that story because when I heard a tiny bit of it, I wanted more because it just was fascinating. But I'm going to leave it there and I'm going to let her share that because Dr. Truthsayer has been practicing for over 20 years and she has a lot of experience to share with us. She has a doctorate in acupuncture and oriental medicine. She has a master's of science in traditional Chinese medicine. She has three degrees in psychology and a bachelor's in Chinese linguistics. She is the president emeritus of the California State of Oriental Medicine Association and a former faculty member of the American College of Traditional Chinese Medicine in San Francisco. Dr. Truth Sayer has been a disciple for 10 years of Dr. Huang Li Chuan, who is world famous uh, physician teacher uh, for auricular medicine and a recognized top expert in that field. Uh, she's been a guest presenter at numerous gatherings and conferences in the U.S. and Taiwan, including the World Academy of Auricular Medicine in 2009 and 2012, and at the World Federation of Traditional Chinese Medicine in 2018. The harp music that you heard playing during the waiting period was 
was actually music composed and played by Dr. Truth Sayre. And I'm really excited to welcome her. Welcome, Dr. Truth Sayre. Mute. And here I am. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you so much, John, for such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> Great. Uh, Welcome. And uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to let you take over and I'll let you um, share your knowledge base with us. I'm sure there's lots of gems, no matter uh, how beginner or how experienced you are, there'll be something for us. Because I already got just something listening to you right from the beginning. So thank you so I'll, much. I'll you okay, so um, I just have to um, get the Get the slideshow up. And there we go. And um, I hope that works and people can see that. And move this over. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, thank you for such a lovely introduction. I have to, uh, I just have to say that I have never given a presentation to a screen before and I know you're all out there but I can't see you and so it's um, it, it's a new experience for me and um, and I hope I don't come across flat as a pancake so um, <laughs> um, I do hope everybody is doing well and taking care of yourself and uh, I loved John's suggestions of moving out of this situation. And I have to say that auricular medicine has a ton to offer. So I'm excited to share with you. Um, and so my, there it is. Uh, okay, so, um, so John did ask about my name and uh, I have to say that I have been on a spiritual path my entire life prior to um, prior to Chinese medicine, prior to psychology, I was a spiritual teacher, healer, worked with energy, um, um, and, and, um, and pursued my spiritual path. And along this path, I, in meditation, sometimes get suggestions on the next step of my path or something to learn or but I have a strong connection and about 35 years ago uh, this name appeared to me uh, without instructions and at the time I was quite happy with my given name and so I really um, had to think about taking on such a courageous name so I kind of put it off for two years and then I tried to take it on partially. I tried to uh, just take it on in articles that I wrote as a pen name, which worked until, um, until answer machines came in. And then when answer mach machines came in and someone called, I didn't know if they were asking for myself or truth sayer. So I really had to uh, either take the name on fully at that point or let it go. So I took it on fully. And all of the things I was afraid of, um, you know, to take on this name, you know, sticking out, all kinds of things that I, I was afraid of did not happen, really did not happen. And I really uh, had amazing experiences with this name. And um, so I don't want to take up the lecture to say much more about it, but it is a profound part of my journey. And for anyone considering a spiritual name, of course, I'm going to encourage you. Um, <laughs> I hope that satisfies some of the curiosity. Um, and uh, as John was saying, I, I'm a doctorate in Chinese medicine. My doctorate actually was the summation of what I call transcendental medicine. That, that is the medicine that I practice in my clinic. It's based on uh, TCM, it, excuse me, a little technical difficulty trying to move this or minimize it if I can. Uh, okay, what that minimizes. No, I'm fine. I got it. It's fine. 
it was obscuring my uh, my screen. Um, but I, so what I practice in clinic is transcendental medicine, which is based on traditional Chinese medicine, classical Chinese medicine, auricular medicine, and psychology. Uh, it is really a um, conceptual and practical framework um, of my understanding of health and disease and and how to work with the body. It's very much based on Chinese medicine, but it um, it includes some Western concepts and it, it's very mind, body, and spirit. And I really focus on uh, working on all of the systems, not exactly simultaneously, but but I'm I'm watching the interaction of systems as I practice. And so auricular medicine is very fundamental to the way that I practice medicine um, because auricular medicine gives me a very, as you will see through my lecture, gives me a very in-depth understanding of what's going on with my patient. Um, but I'm also, um, I'm also sharing this because the way that I practice is a little bit different than my teacher. Um, so, um, so, um, so that is my background. Yes, I've, I've, uh, given numerous presentations, auricular transcendental medicine in the United States and Taiwan, and I founded the Institute of Auricular Transcendental Medicine and started teaching, uh, this medicine about seven years ago at the behest of my teacher. Um, and so, um, um, so that's enough about me. <laughs> um, but my, my doctorate was really a written summation and a presentation of transcendental medicine. So this is not working. Let's see if I can do it manually. There you go. And this is um, Dr. Huang a year before she retired. And she was either 80 or I think she was 80 or almost 80 at that point in time. Um, and, uh, so to give you some background and history of auricular medicine, I want to distinguish auricular medicine from ear acupuncture, which is what most of us in this field have some training in at least. Um, and I'm going to call what we were trained in ear acupuncture. And ear acupuncture precedes the Neijing, but is referred to in the Neijing. And Dr. Xu Zuolin was my teacher's teacher. Um, and uh, at around that time, which was the late 50s, early 60s, um, China um, was a new country with a huge population and not enough doctors. Um, the Chinese government very much uh, valued Western medicine and so called for a cooperation between Western medicine doctors and Chinese medicine doctors, but there weren't enough doctors. So the, the government encouraged research and, and training in both disciplines. Um, but the government also uh, sent out barefoot doctors they were called such because they received some minimum training in both Western medicine and Chinese medicine, and particularly ear acupuncture, since it was uh, less dangerous for people that didn't have in-depth training and very effective. And uh, so they went out all over China. And they, uh, at that time, uh, a lot of Chinese medicine was not concentrated um, centralized in schools. It was within family traditions passed down. It was within smaller schools passed down. So all of these people went out uh, and gathered experiential information and gathered uh, information that was out there and brought it back and, um, and just uh, collected enormous amounts of information, which, be, which eventually developed into the Shanghai map, which is what we were all trained on. Um, so and then you have auricular therapy that was developing in Europe. I'll talk about that in a minute. 
And that's very much differentiated from auricular medicine, which was Dr. Huang Li Chun who really put together diagnosis and treatment and organized it into a system of medicine. Um, and uh, she was nominated by the World Health Organization as the top expert world, worldwide. Um, and so she's called the mother of auricular medicine. Um, and then uh, myself, I practice auricular medicine within transcendental medicine. So, um, so my practice of it has, over a 10 year period, has really become my own version. Um, so when I'm teaching Dr. Huang's material, I am trying to say uh, clear and present her material. So the history over 3000 years, the Huang Di Nei Jing has uh, mentions um, auricular medicine. By inspecting the ear, one knows whether the individual has an illness or not. All 12 channels enter the ear. So this is already talking about both diagnosis and treatment. It records the relationship between the ear, meridians, and the organs. Um, it's already describing the conceptual framework of um, the ear as a microsystem, but that is part of the meridians, the organs, reflects the state of health and is amenable to treatment. So there, is, there are some quotes. Uh, the characters here say uh, to, um, to look at the ear, one knows uh, the characteristics of the person's state of health or pathology. So it's reflected on the ear. Um, so, and there were methods of treatment going back into ancient times that are documented. So needling the ear, also moxibustion on the ear and blowing herbs into the ear, massaging the ear. Um, so the history goes way back and is complex. Uh, this is a picture of Dr. Stusel and he devoted 40 years of his life to developing ear acupuncture. And Dr. Huang developed 45 years of her life. So, um, so Dr. Huang um, came from a uh, Western medicine family. Her father was doctor of uh, Western medicine. He taught anatomy and physiology. Everyone in her family um, uh, is Western medically trained. She herself uh, is a uh, surgeon and an anesthesiologist. She was in the military. So she was the head of a hospital um, in the military. And then uh, at one point she injured a finger and she couldn't, uh, she couldn't operate. And uh, her commanding officer wanted to get her mind off of things and, and just kind of pushed her into an ear acupuncture class with Dr. Xu Zolin and Dr. Huang Li Chun, who had no Chinese medicine background became really enthralled with the ears microsystem and set about really studying Chinese medicine and studying ear acupuncture. So, and then she, um, she eventually was saying that she was treating 200 patients a day, which I can't even imagine. Um, so she was practicing in the military. So around that time, the late fifth, oh, well, let's talk about the, uh, the history. So, uh, Xu Zolin devoted his life. He discovered points and he also, uh, and he also worked with the discoveries that were happening around that time frame, um, in the late fifties. And so he discovered, uh, mental emotional points, vision points, reproductive points, anatomical points. And as I was saying, the, ex the experimentation with East and West and 
happening all over China, they were experimenting with all different kinds of treatment methods. So electrical stimulations, point, all of this in the oracle, point injection therapy, needle embedding therapy, plum blossom needling therapy, pasting medical, which is putting herbs onto the ear, clamping therapy. And then those last three are the ones that Dr. Huang created and practiced. So Dr. Huang uh, felt that needling, which she did do, but um, not as much. She believed it was too painful. So she and her team set about finding an alternative. And they experimented well all different kinds of uh, metal balls and, and uh, big balls, and little balls, and all kinds of seeds. And after experimenting with everything, they felt that uh, therapeutically, uh, best results were with the eukarya seed, and that's what is prevalent now. Uh, and so she uses um, auricular seed therapy almost exclusively. Bleeding therapy, she developed uh, beyond just um, what we were taught in school of needing the, um, the top of the ear. So she has a much more developed bleeding therapy and auricular massage therapy. Uh, this is Dr. Suzolin map, and you can see that it is vastly not as developed as when they get so much information from all over China and it becomes to be more extensive. Um, so, and from 59 to 2001, they, um, they were bringing back all of that information writing research papers, having conventions, reporting it. Um, so millions of patients involved in the research. Dr. Huang, being head of a hospital um, and being Western trained, conducted research uh, on all of the points. So I have found the difference between her map and the Shanghai map to be really immense. There are points in common but Dr. Huang's map is very exact and very accurate and very dependable. And the reason for that is that each point in terms of function and efficacy, she has over 500 cases documenting each point. It's really tremendous. Um, so, see, so this is the Shanghai map that we are all familiar with. Um, so it, there is a lot that is in common with Dr. Huang's map, uh, but then there are also huge differences. And one of the differences is that the Shanghai map doesn't even use the posterior of the ear. Dr. Huang has developed the posterior of the ear and the use of it is quite extensive. So, um, and... So uh, Dr. Paul Noget uh, was a medical doctor in France and in the late 50s, he had a patient who had very bad sciatica and was not getting much better. And then that patient disappeared for a while, came back and no more sciatic pain, came back for some other issue. And so uh, Paul Noget said, uh, what happened? And the patient said, well, I went to a, a a strange Chinese doctor and he cauterized this point and no more pain. So that intrigued Dr. Noje and he had a uh, Chinese medicine, an acupuncturist friend and decided to learn uh, ear acupuncture from this friend. And he was, as he was learning it, he was trying to figure out, uh, you know, a sort of a system and a method for understanding it and for for it making sense to him. And so he came up with the idea based on where the points were all located to um, think of it as an inverted fetus. And that for those of us that practice Chinese medicine is one of his great contributions. Very, very, very um, useful contribution. Um, 
but and and this is his map which is very he created his own map uh which is very different and he used the pulse uh to help him find accuracy not the chinese medicine pulse but just your regular pulse and then he created something called phases so the whole maps would shift depending on stage of illness it's been a while since i looked at it but that's an idea. It's very popular in Europe. Um, and he passed away, but his son is still teaching. It's still popular, mostly in Europe. Um, and uh, it's very different. It's based on Western medicine and very, very different. Um, so Dr. Huang Li Chun, who I've told you about, um, she directed the research she uh collected so much of this information about um diagnosis and treatment she contributed her own uh research of many points um and uh and organized all of this material into a system that's systematized and the depth is so sophisticated that it's kind of mind-boggling. So this is her contribution. Um, on the backs of all the <laughs> doctors and the, in China that contributed. And thank God for the, uh, for the movement at that time of joining Western and Chinese medicine. So, um, so I think I covered this. She systematized the map. She then went and taught around the world. She treated presidents. She tra treated the president of Italy and he gave her a reward. She treated, um, he wanted to build her a school in Italy, um, uh, but she declined. She uh, treated uh, Castro, Fidel Castro, the president of Cuba, and was sent by China to establish a school in Cuba, which she did. And um, uh, for uh, Chinese medicine and acupuncture and also for um, auricular medicine, she's taught all over the world. Um, and uh, if, you know, the reason why my Chinese is important is because really uh, to master this medicine, you had to speak fluent Chinese because her lectures were in Chinese. She reads and writes, but she couldn't lecture in English. If she had been able to, she would have many, many years ago been exceedingly famous in the English speaking world. Um, but anyways, she taught all over the world. Um, so the difference between ear acupuncture and auricular medicine so ear acupuncture has approximately 90 points and auricular medicine has approximately 210. Um, the posterior of the ear is not used in ear acupuncture and it has, there's extensive use in auricular medicine. Uh, ear acupuncture is treatment only. Auricular medicine has complex, it's really comprehensive diagnosis and that diagnosis uh, really uh, is not only important for diagnosis, but it's important for treatment because the more accurate your diagnosis, the more successful your treatment will be. Um, so ear acupuncture is very simple classification. Auricular medicine is very systematic classification and you'll see a little bit more as I go on. Um, ear acupuncture has stimulation for treatment, but auricular medicine has other skilled techniques in addition. Um, ear acupuncture really considers the ear as extra points. So you do a treatment, you might add a few ear points as extra points, but auricular medicine is a complete and powerful system of medicine. You can learn auricular medicine and practice nothing but auricular medicine and uh, open a practice and see the whole range of patients that any of us would see in our practice um, with 
wonderful results. So it, for both diagnosis and treatment, it's extremely powerful. So auricular medicine, oh, and the other thing I didn't put there, but the other thing is that auricular medicine also uh, is very amenable to um, melding Western medicine and Chinese medicine. And in our world today, that is very useful. So, um, so diagnosis by examining the oracle, treatment uh, by stimulation of, of acupuncture points on the oracle. So, and I think I'm repeating, but let's repeat. Complete system of medicine, diagnosis and treatment Real integrative medicine combines TCM Western medicine. Um, it's what the Western medicine that it combines. So anatomy, physiology, it, it combines, it really combines as much as you know, but for basics, it, it combines embryology, it combines endocrinology, it uses neurology uh, and fluidism. I hope I haven't forgotten one. Um, so the more that you have, the richer your diagnosis and treatment in terms of Western medicine. It combines TCM because all of the meridians go to the ear. And so you're not only using uh, localized points on the ear, but you're using the meridian system as well. And you're using all of TCM understanding of, of health and illness and pathology and how that works. Um, so your, your results are dependent on how thoroughly you understand both of these medicines. But you, know, you could use it only with TCM, you could use it only with Western, but it would be a shadow of itself. Uh, it's based on the microsystem of the Oracle. That is so important because really once you have mastered this medicine, you, when you're doing a diagnosis, you're literally seeing the body on the ear and like an x-ray machine, but you're, you're seeing within the body, you're seeing the person's state of health right before you as it is before you. And um, you can access every part of the body on the ear. It's quite phenomenal that way. So um, uses two systems within the body, neurological and meridian systems. And auricular medicine is very sophisticated um, due to all of that research. So the foot is a microsystem, but it's not very developed. Um, the hand is microsystem, um, perhaps more so developed if you're Korean and <laughs> have studied all of that. It's more developed. Um, but the ear is just incredibly researched and developed and systematized. So it, it just becomes available for you as a clinician. And it's incredibly clinically effective. As I talk cases, um, you'll see. So the system, so this is a um, chart of Dr. Huang's diagnosis system. And if you follow her path of diagnosing, you are basically uh, going, and, and you can just follow these lines and follow her path. Uh, and you, there are about 210 points in, uh, in auricular medicine. For diagnosis, I'm going to look at somewhere between 100 to 100 and maybe 80 points that I'm actually examining in this diagnosis. So systematized is extremely valuable. When, uh, when I do a diagnosis, a uh, patient comes in and fills out all kinds of paperwork. Um, I do not look at any of the paperwork. I don't even know the chief complaint. Um, when the patient walks in the door, I sit them down and I start doing the, the diagnosis and I'm talking to the patient. I have somebody taking notes because it goes too fast. So somebody takes notes 
of everything I'm seeing. And I'm, I'm saying what I'm seeing as I'm <laughs> examining the patient. And when I'm through, I have covered everything in their intake that I didn't see, all that paperwork. And very often I am uncovering things that they didn't know or that they've forgotten or that they're too embarrassed to talk about. Um, so I get a much more thorough picture um, than just reading the paperwork. So what am I looking at? I'm looking at the reproductive system, the urinary system, liver, gallbladder, pancreas, digestive system, the abdominal cavity, cardiovascular system, respiratory system, five sense organ, endocrine system, neurological system, brain, limbic system. I can see whether they are um, uh, depressed, whether they're anxious, uh, what kind of emotional condition, I, um, musculoskeletal system, immune system, skin, tumor detection. This is all just part of the exam. So basically, if you think about the TCM 10 questions that we ask, when I have looked with a fine tooth comb through all of those systems and uncovered pathology, I have pretty much answered most of these 10 questions. Sometimes I'll ask patients about their sense of temperature or um, thirsty or diet. Uh, in addition, but for the most part, I have answered much of these questions in, in depth. So um, this is my teacher's intake, and my teacher being a Western doctor, she will look over the cardiovascular system and actually look for, uh, she will be coming up with diagnoses that are Western. So she is um, looking at the heart, and, uh, and she will circle whatever condition that she is seeing. Um, since I am not a Western doctor, I, I do a very thorough intake on all the systems, but I'm not going to be coming up with Western diagnosis. <laughs> so my intake is a little bit different, but this is her intake. She goes over in depth and every, every system, and then she will look at the TCM, she'll look tongue, she'll take pulse, and she'll come up with TCM. Um, so that is her system. So how, you know, when I'm looking at a patient, what am I looking at? How, how am I being able to diagnose, it, diagnose disease? Very much like the tongue, visual detection, we're looking for morphological changes, we're looking at the size, the shape, texture, color, um, skin uh, changes. Uh, I'm also using an instrument and I am feeling for any irregularities, but yes, irregular nodules, growth, depression, hardness, softness, density, texture, um, and all of that means something. Just like with tongue diagnosis, just a lot more detail. Um, and also machine detection, there's the, the, uh, the instrument I'm using also will pick up degrees of electrical discharge that gives me additional information and tenderness. And, you know, in the beginning, you ask the patient how tender this is, uh, and the patient is participating in the exam that way. Uh, at this point, I am mostly knowing how tender it is for the patient as I'm working. And then you're comparing it with your training and experience to normal and pathological oracles. So that is how it works. So um, I, I'm, I can't give an in-depth lecture, but just as examples, you can see color differences on this oracle. So this is a deeper color. This is quite a reddened area. This is uh, perhaps sort of normal looking, it looks similar to that. This area here looks kind of pale. This area here looks kind of pale. This area here may be normal, maybe a little pale. This area here is a little red as well. So, um, so that just gives an indication of color. 
if you look at this helix and compare it with the next one I'm showing you, this one seems full and uh, if I were talking, if I were feeling this patient, it would be nice and, and soft and not too soft, but healthy. And then you look at this next oracle and it's very thin into this area where it's disappearing. So those are the kinds of differences. And if you look at this patient, uh, you, you notice that there is a groove here. So that is something to be noted. There's a vein right here that is almost slightly purplish. And then there are micro veins. My pointer went away, the micro veins in this area. So those are things that we would look at. This patient uh, has a longevity ear. So what's a longevity ear? If you look at this patient's face, the ear is large and the lobe is large. If you look at here, this is quite a large lobe proportionately with this patient. And oh, back again. Ooh. Oh. Oh. Sorry, folks. Can you just, uh, just uh, on your keyboard? It's just going forward. It won't go back. Forward. So the, the left and the right arrow keys, can you click on your keyboard? They, uh, the keyboard is not working at Oh, now it's working. Oh, that's delightful. Wow. The keyboard is not working. I can now have better control over it. Thank you so much, Dylan. Yeah. OK. So this, um, OK. So, uh, so the, there you can see, in proportion to the person's face, that they have quite a large ear and quite a large earlobe. This person is in her late 80s. And she had the vivaciousness and the chi, the energy of somebody probably in her, uh, in her 40s or early 50s anyway. And she looked visually like somebody in her 60s. But she was in her late 80s. I mean, so it, it's just, uh, auricular medicine is quite, quite amazing. Um, so then this is another uh, longevity ear. Um, we don't have the whole face, but if you saw the whole face, it's a larger ear and a larger lobe. Looking like, if you look at uh, Chinese statues of Buddha or Kuan Yin, you will see that the ear is rather large because it's longevity ear. So, you know, there are things about auricular medicine that have been in the culture for thousands of years. This is a patient of mine, an interesting why diagnosis is so useful to me. Um, so you see this red area right here. This is the chest area. So this patient was here for early onset dementia and uh, that day for neck, uh, neck pain, headache pain, so on. Um, but I noticed this was an ongoing patient. I noticed the red area and you know this patient is an alzheimer's patient she would not necessarily communicate discomfort to me so i asked her if she would be willing to pull up her shirt and she was and so you can see next slide she had a severe rash started here it got worse and worse as it went up and it was quite uncomfortable for this patient and she would not have said anything if i hadn't examined her ear but because i examined her ear i treated one treatment for this rash and no herbs thank goodness because this patient would forget about taking herbs and it was hard to keep this patient on herbs so just one auricular treatment and next week when she came in and now it's not responding again Dylan, can you get my... Uh, maybe click on the slide. And I'm clicking on the slide and it's not... Uh... Now, now press on the keyboard, right? Not moving, let's... Uh, and I can't find my pointer, whoops. Looks like it's frozen. Why don't you just um... let's 
So just scroll down on the left to the slide that you were just at. Can you see? We can actually see your. I can PowerPoint. see it, but I can't get my uh, cursor to function. My my cursor is irretrievable. It is not. Oh. Cursor has disappeared. Are you using a mouse? Um. Let's. Cursor is back. Okay. Um, yeah, just go to the left instead of starting the slideshow. Just just find just where you were down. And be faster. Yeah, huh. it is. Cursor keeps disappearing. Let's see if I can. Do you have a mouse plugged in? Yeah, the, I'm clicking the mouse and it it is responding or not responding. It might maybe just unplug it and use the touchpad on your computer. Same thing, cannot retrieve the cursor. Hmm. Uh, um, As those words. I could talk without slides, but it would be slightly boring. <laughs> um, is there? Well, did you do some? Did you do some? No, I didn't do anything. But I can request remote control. I don't know if it's possible for you to accept that. Yes. Uh, okay. I approve, but I can't click on it because I have no cursor. Try to plug your mouse in one more time because it it worked that one time, right? So unplug it and plug it in again. Your mouse? Yeah, I'm doing so. Approve, got it. Okay. So just technology yeah, even letting me do anything. So I think we're just gonna stop your share and then now see if it's letting you move your mouse when this share is I do off. have the mouse. I have the mouse as long as I don't go to the uh, to my slides. If I go to my slides, then it's not responding. Oh, that's maybe because it's frozen then, your slides. Uh, slides are frozen. Yeah. Uh, do I click the slides off and then click them back on? If you can quit it, quit that and then and open it up again. Maybe that is what I should do. Yes, I will click this. If I can get to it, I will click the slides off and the so sorry for this and try to get it back up again. Uh, totally fine. Were you able to quit it? No, I thought I had, but so no, I'm not. So at the top left, there's an Apple icon. And then just click force quit. Uh, Can't get the cursor back. Oh, I got the cursor back and uh, can't, I, I, the, the PowerPoint is just frozen. Yeah. Oh, it, okay, I got it. I got it. And we can try this again. So I will just okay. click on it and try it again. I got it. It's coming back mm -hmm. up. Quit it and you opened it up again? I'm opening it up again. Okay, yeah. You'll have to share your screen again one more time. I'll have to share screen. I'll do that, not a problem. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, well, it's, I... there are some questions. We could take a moment uh, now. Oh, you sure, ask a question. Uh, I can ask, uh, while I'm doing this, I can. Go. Yeah, while you're loading it up, let's ask some questions. Yeah, I can, yeah, sure, go ahead. Stephanie is asking, do moles in the ear have a significance? 
Uh, I would tend to think not. Um, I would always, you know, anything that happens in the ear, I would, uh, I would check the location and I would think about it in context of everything I know about the patient um, before dismissing it. But uh, based on experience, my, my first response to that question is no. Okay. And then uh, another question here from Maria is, sure. uh, what machine do you use in your diagnosis? What is it called? That is a really good question. I have the faintest idea. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure it's like a point finder. I mean, it's a, uh, the, the instrument that I use, I uh, purchased from my teacher. And Dr. Huang Yichun does have a website and her daughter is, um, has, you know, taken over. So, um, so I, I should have prepared that, but in any case, if you search Dr. Huang Li Chun, you'll find it. And her, da her daughter is still selling the equipment and still selling books. Um, and uh, that is the, the instrument that I use and that I recommend for my students. So, um, so I'm going to now see yeah, if so I can share the screen. Back on Zoom, click share screen and then click your click your PowerPoint. So I'm going to share screen again and um, oh it has now PowerPoint and PowerPoint recovered. It shouldn't make a difference. Just click. Shouldn't make a difference. Great. Okay. Just click then. recovered, I guess. Oh, I clicked it. That's up. fine. That's fine. Um, so, yeah. So you now. Can find your slide. So there are two versions. On, maybe that was the problem. But in any case, I will just click slideshow and we'll be back in business. And, uh, and, and now my board is working, which is so much better than the pointer anyway. Um, and so back to, the interesting slides of treatment. So, um, yeah, so we had that red area here was her chest. She pulled it up. She had this really um, uncomfortable rash and next week she came in rash was gone her rash was probably gone that very day um but uh, in any case next week she came in her rash was gone and she was much more comfortable so uh, that's one reason among so many others that diagnosis is important for me because um my patient not, might not be able to talk to me you know i can treat somebody that that can't talk at all and uh, I can know what's going on with them and how to treat. It's really amazing medicine. Um, so this next slide is showing morphological change. So uh, let me see if I have my cursor. Um, I, my cursor, oh, there it is. Okay, so this area right here is the spine. And you can see that it's swollen, maybe with no experience that you don't know, but um, it, it also looks like there's a ridge here and a ridge here and a ridge here. Uh, my cursors disappeared, but that is you can uh, see severe osteoarthritis of the spine. Um, and so it really reflects. Uh, it reminds me of a patient I had with severe bone cancer that was like that, only it was more purplish. Um, very similar. So here, uh, just to show location, so uh, this is varicose veins of the leg, and this is the leg location on the ear, and it is swollen, and you have purple uh, vascular, uh, purple swelling on the location of the, of the leg. This is why um, Dr. Huang's map is so invaluable, because it's so accurate. Um, this is a patient with a tumor on her cheek, 
and uh, which you can see the tumor. And then her earlobe, this area is the cheek area on the oracle, and you can see the corresponding swelling. So the benefits of diagnosis. Um, you have immediate results, obviously. P patient comes in in that hour and a half to two hours, I am telling them everything that's going on. They don't have to wait. They get to hear um, the results right there. There's no invasive test. I'm looking at the outside of the ear. I'm not going into their ear. No expensive tests eliminates toxic exposure. Um, it allows indirect access to inaccessible or inconveniently accessible body parts. So I'd have patients uh, with uh, huge anxiety and uh, some musculoskeletal pain, usually accompanies anxiety. And so I'm doing the intake and I'm noting that there is, uh, uh, that there is pain and sort of inflammation, strain of a ligament uh, um, uh, in his private parts, let's say. <laughs> but I knew exact, I could know exactly where. And you know, this is something that patients are not necessarily gonna feel comfortable telling you, especially they've never even met you. Um, but because I found it in, in the exam and mentioned it, um, patient was very grateful and one treatment resolved the pain and he said yes I was bike riding and uh, injured myself and you know I, I was able to detect it and treat it and resolve it in one treatment so that is the part of the magic it's very precise I can say you know if I if there's a I detect the knee problem, I can tell if it is medial, lateral, superior, posterior. So I, I can get very, very precise, um, which is really helpful in treatment. You know, if diagnosis can be more precise than treatment can be more precise. It provides detailed, reliable patient history, often forgotten or unknown to the patient. Um, so, uh, you know, patients will, sometimes contradict me, I'll, you know, I'll say you had a car accident, or you had some kind of accident uh, a long time ago that is not completely healed. Oh no, uh, no, never had an injury to that area. And then I see them next time or the time after they say, you know, you told me I had an accident. Yeah, I was talking to my mother and she said that when I was three or whatever it was, I, I, I fell down and hit my head or whatever it was. And, um, but, but my having that information, if it's on the ear, it's pertinent. It, it, you know, it, the person could have had an accident and it's not showing on the ear and that's because it's no longer pertinent. It's healed up, it's irrelevant. But when it's on the ear, it's pertinent and it's pertinent to me because I, wanna, uh, I want all the information possible to give them the best results possible. Um, so uh, with ear diag auricular diagnosis, we can diagnose disease in early stages, sometimes years before symptoms appear or tests able to detect. So it enables real preventive medicine. So for instance, I had a patient came to me that was just visiting the area and uh, I found high blood pressure that she didn't know she had. I, I found some other things. But I also was concerned about something with both the liver and the kidney and concerned enough that I said to her, please, when you go back, have your doctor do a thorough exam. Um, and she didn't. <laughs> and then she called me a year and a half later and said, uh, I had some low back pain. So I went into the doctor and had an MRI done and the doctor found some really tiny white lesions on my kidney and liver. And, uh, and the doctor says they're too, too small to be of concern now, but we're gonna keep an eye on them. That was a year and a half post her exam with me. So not only she didn't have symptoms, but it was probably before it would have shown up on a test, but that's how sensitive the ear is. So, you know, so that means if I have the trust of my patients, and I do, if I uncover something that I don't have to have a Western diagnosis, I don't have to give it a name, 
But if I'm concerned, I can start treatment and resolve before it ever develops into something. That's real preventive medicine. And also it creates a baseline. So not only for me, but for the patient, the way that I work. So if I'm examining and I'm finding, um, I mean, even, you know, even if I'm treating endocrine system, if I'm treating endocrine system, let's say that the thyroid is very, very tender. Um, so the thyroid is something that you're not going to, you know, if I'm treating neck pain, they're going to know that right away. But if I'm treating the thyroid, let's say, they, they're not going to know whether it's getting better or not so quickly. But uh, every time they come in for exam, when I'm going over that area, I'm teaching them. I'm saying, okay, that pain that you're that's thyroid. The next time they come in, I go over that area. Oh, it's not as painful. Uh, oh, and then, you know, slowly, oh, yes, I notice that my symptoms are improving. That might take a few more weeks. So it creates a baseline for my, not only myself, but for my patient. So it's very, very useful. Um, and it's comprehensive. For me, that's indispensable because what transcendental medicine is, is really um, seeing the whole enchilada of, of imbalances and working. Um, it's not simultaneous, but, you know, often if, if this area of, of, pathology it is not resolved you can't you can work on that all day long nothing's going to happen you have to treat this area and then and then you can treat that area and it will work or there may be psychological issues you don't address those nothing in the body is going to move so you know transcendental medicine really wants to go to the depth which is what the Neijing says you have to go to um to spirit level the depth to get fundamental shift, you have to create a shift in consciousness. But I have to also work all the parts. So auricular medicine allows me to see the full picture and how they interact. It's really amazing medicine. Um, that is uh, Dr. Huang's map. I don't have a, a, a flat representation. <laughs> That's her map. Um, Auricular medicine treatment benefits, immediate results. I, uh, uh, next slide, I'm going to talk about a lot of immediate results, both immediate and ongoing efficacy. Um, so it isn't just a magic, it is a magic show, but it isn't just a magic show, it also is ongoing efficacy. Very precise, inconvenient body parts, uh, both neurological and meridian systems access and patient participation. So they participate because they can feel the difference on the ear um, because I'm teaching them, but also uh, with ear scenes, they press them and they can feel the difference. They can feel, um, they can feel it as they're working with it. So you get better patient participation. Um, my teacher, uh, one of, one of the, her classes uh, asked us to uh, make a list of one treatment wonders and i it was amazing to me because i just sat down in the space of a few minutes i had a huge long list of um one treatment wonders in clinic that it it, it just was really uh uplifting of my spirits to do that little exercise um so right before i was uh going to teach this class i did that again i sat down and just threw a bunch out and so here are some examples um, because auricular medicine is so precise, it, it, it's amazing. I had a patient with seven years of restless leg syndrome, and, uh, and they came in, and um, with the first needle, it already reduced. Uh, at the end of the first treatment, there was no more restless leg syndrome. And I explained to the patient that I like to treat the root, not just the branch, um, and that it was to her benefit to keep coming, um, but she decided not to. And so then she came back three weeks later, she said on zero to 10, she had a 0.5 um, of restless leg coming back, she wanted to nip it in the bud. So we did one treatment, nipped it in the bud, and I haven't seen her since, um, and would have if it had resumed. 
Um, so patient nausea, patient with, um, with um, pregnancy nausea. And so, you know, just a few needles, two, three needles resolved it. Uh, burns, so I had a patient uh, come in e immediately, I mean, shortly after hot oil burning the hand and um, screaming. I mean, they were, came in, they were screaming, they couldn't stop screaming. So I put in needles and within seconds, they were stopped, the, the pain was going down and they stopped screaming. At the end of the treatment, they, they would have had blisters. There were no blisters. The next day, I get a phone call. There is not only no pain, there's no redness, there's no evidence that there was even a burn. I've done that numerous, numerous times. Um, that's instant efficacy and ongoing efficacy. If a patient has blisters started, I can minimize it and I can facilitate the healing process, but if they've already started, I can't, I can't, um, I can just help it to get better. But if I can get it before blisters start, they won't even happen. Fantastic. Dizziness. I had a patient um, with Meniere's disease and uh, frequent uh, dizziness and very disturbing dizziness. And um, and so we treated the Meniere's. The Meniere's was, was uh, in a much better, she was much better overall, but she still had some dizziness and she was going on a three week motorcycle trip and dizziness when you're on a motorcycle, not a good thing. So we did ear seeds and, um, and she, she religiously pressed those ear seeds, um, but she also had to wear a helmet, right? And the helmet was somewhat digging into the ear seed and she would not remove them for three weeks because they were so effective and because they were working. So she came back three weeks later, I had to treat her for one of the ear seeds had gotten a little bit, it didn't get infected, but it had broken the skin and had you know, caused pain and had to treat her for that. So anyway, many cases of dizziness. Um, I already told you the private parts story. Actually, I had numerous private parts stories. I mean, basically, people don't want to talk about it. So, you know, if I can find it without having to ask them, it, it just goes easier. They're very grateful when I bring it up and, and I treat it. Kidney stone story, really great story. So I had a patient, ongoing patient, who was a nurse, and... Um, she came in with severe, severe pain. Uh, she was in so much pain, she could hardly get on the table. And she said that she had gone to her physician first. She's a nurse, so she was gone to work, but she couldn't work. She was in too much pain. And her doctor had ruled out everything else and said that it was uh, just simple low back pain and go to, go to your acupuncturist. So she came to me. If I did not do diagnosis and followed what the patient had told me, then I would have treated low back pain. And that would have been wrong in this case. Because I do ear diagnosis and I, um, and I don't want to treat the wrong thing. So I did ear diagnosis and I found that she had kidney stones. And so I did not treat for low back pain. I only treated for kidney stones. And by the end of the treatment, she was still in a little bit of pain. She wasn't 100%, but she could get off the table. She was able to talk. She was in much better condition. She went to work. She's standing the whole time at work, and, uh, and she was fine. And then she called me two days later, and she said, because um, I'd also given her herbs, and she said, do I have to keep taking these herbs because she had no more symptoms? Um, and I said, yes, of course you do. And she did, and she was an ongoing patient, so she would have called back if there was any problem, no problems. And that was one treatment. All of these are one treatment. Muscular skeletal pain, there's too many stories that I could tell you. Uh, I mean, just, just countless stories of, of patients that, you know, um, uh, that go from a frozen shoulder where they can't even move to not only be being in, out of pain, but being able to raise their arm up freely. I mean, just numerous stories. I had neuropathy, I had a patient, um, and, and this was when I was still a student. I had a patient with 10 years of neuropathy in her fingers, and I 
uh, gave one treatment and I got a call from the clinic uh, saying that um, she insisted that I be called and told because she was so happy that her neuropathy was completely gone. And it just, um, and that was when I was still a student. Any kind of swelling on the face, uh, tooth swelling, um, knee uh, from operations or, or accidents um, resolves quickly. Rashes, I told you one story, but I have numerous stories of different kinds of rashes that resolve. Uh, nightmares is kind of a little odd, um, but I had a, a patient with years of nightmares, one treatment resolved, it's kind of an odd thing. TMJ, I didn't put it down, but TMJ oftentimes responds very quickly. Toothache was my teacher. So we were, um, you know, uh, so my teacher would come and teach numerous times a year to the United States who she was teaching. And uh, we, we went to lunch and oftentimes the students would uh, take us all to lunch and um, provide little banquets. It was really amazing. Um, I really miss all of that, I have to say. But anyway, um, so we were at one of these little banquets and, um, and my teacher uh, ha had made an appointment with a dentist because she was in so much tooth pain and she was in so much pain she wasn't eating. And if she went to the dentist, she was gonna miss the class in the afternoon. And so I don't know where I got the uh, courage, but I begged her to let me put one needle in. And uh, she doesn't like needles. <laughs> she is my teacher, so it was very brave of me. But she finally said, okay, and I only had this one chance, so it had to be good. <laughs> I put the needle in. She didn't say anything, but she started eating. And she was punctually on time for classes in the afternoon. So she must have gone to see the, uh, the dentist either in the evening or some other time because she was out of pain. So that was, that was my one story with that. Um, so I'm... Choking, so choking, uh, when I was getting my doctorate, we were using um, moxa, and the room was too filled with moxa, there wasn't enough ventilation. One of the students started choking, having allergic reaction, but the uh, throat was closing up, and, uh, and, and uh, she was kind of panicking with it. And so I offered to help, and with two needles, um, got the throat to release, got the lungs to clear, and cleared up the whole situation. Um, dysmenorrhea is very, very, uh, I have so many stories I can't say. It's easy fix with auricular medicine. Allergies, um, you know, I, allergies I have an, uh, often improvement, but one, one treatment eradicates it. Not, I don't have many stories, but I have one story. Um, so I'm a spiritual teacher, as I was saying, uh, and so I was, uh, uh, at, at one point I had a, a clinic in San Francisco and a home office in addition, and I was offering a um, spiritual healing for people, spiritual teaching and healing, and people were arriving, and one of the people who, who came was very, very allergic to cats and dogs, and I have animals, so within five minutes of being there, was starting to tear and itch and just was not going to be able to stay. So I invited her into the clinic and gave her one treatment um, with auricular medicine and then proceeded to a four-hour um, spiritual gathering. And I really believe in transcendental medicine. Transcendental is mind, body, spirit. And that treatment was... You know, the, the auricular medicine took care of the body and the spiritual gathering took care of the mind and the spirit. And uh, that patient has never had her allergies return. And that was many years ago. That, that was, I don't know, something like 14 years ago. It's a long time ago. Um, stopped bleeding. I had a patient with a very rare bleeding condition that he would get little, uh, little things that opened up in internally and externally. And he had one externally, I think it was on his lip somewhere. 
and it won't, won't stop bleeding unless it's cauterized a lot of the time. And it had, it had been, it, it was heavy bleeding, but it just doesn't stop bleeding. Um, so he came in and with auricular medicine, it stopped the bleeding within minutes. Uh, belly button pain. Now that's a very, very hard location. You can actually needle the belly button, but that could be painful. There's actually an area for the belly button on the oracle. Any place in the body can be found on the ear. Every part of the body. So one needle for the belly button pain resolved it. Shingles, I think that's my last story I'm gonna tell. Shingles was my most amazing treatment that I have ever witnessed. I had a patient with a shingles outbreak on the face. And, uh, and there, were, there were lines that were almost black, they were dark purple, uh, going on the face this way, lines. And then there was a um, blister, a very big blister at the edge of the mouth. And the person's face was almost black, it was grayish black. And the person was just in a lot of pain. Um, and uh, and I put in needles. It was a 30 minute treatment that I wished I had a camera and could have filmed it because it was just sensational. You watch this patient, put the needles in, and you watch this patient's face go from, you know, dark to darker, you know, almost like black, and the, the, and the lines were getting darker. And then it went to different shades of colors, and it went to sort of white, grayish, wow. and then whitish. And then it went to bright red. And then slowly, by the time half an hour was up, it was back to a normal, beautiful color. And all of the lines were gone. And the only thing left was the blister that was about maybe an eighth, maybe a quarter of the size of the original blister. It, it, there was just a remnant of a blister and no pain. And the patient did not come back because it was resolved. Really amazing. Okay, um, these are some of my teacher's cases. Uh, she has pictures, I wish I did, but I have to learn how to take pictures. Anyway, uh, so that, uh, those were the first, it was a Bell's palsy type of situation. So uh, that was, if I get my pointer, the first, when the patient first came in, that was after the first treatment, so second visit and third visit. And so, yeah, we're not completely done here, but just amazing, three, three visits. This is uh, like a vitiligo type of situation, and it was getting, it was expanding. So these were just really starting to expand and get worse and worse. And with one treatment, they are starting to recede. And this is... I don't really know what kind of skin disease, but you know, visually it's very impressive. One treatment and it's moving down. And I don't know how many treatments more before it completely resolved. So, um, oh, I'm at the end of my discussion. So my transcendental medicine is my conceptual framework. As I said, it goes to the root of disease with the goal of achieving a transformation of consciousness. So I educate my patients as I'm working with them. I work with mind, body, and spirit. And, um, and I'm working with the interaction of all of the systems of the body. So my intake has to be extremely comprehensive, as I've said before. And I'm going to share um, a little bit more of a case. So this is my last case. A female in her 60s, overweight, extremely fatigued, depressed, eyes dull, head down, her chief complaint past week was stomach flu, nausea, alternative chills and heat, not a fever, just a sensation of flush, extreme fatigue, last three days having a migraine, and today her headache was six out of 10. So my short auricular exam, these are what I found on a short exam. Hypothyroid, erratic blood pressure, chronic sinus, postnasal drip, chronic adrenal activation, limbic system was very um, 
overactive, nervous system was hyperactive, musculoskeletal, chronic neck and shoulder tension, and remnants of two previous motor vehicle accidents, frontal temporal headache, digestive tract entirely inflamed. That was all found from the auricular exam without talking. So my TCM diagnosis, Shaoyang condition affecting middle lower jowl, liver chi stagnation, adding to deficiency heat, liver yang rising, excess damp, spleen and kidney chi deficiency, headache, and shun disturbance. So my treatment, auricular treatment, I address the entire digestive tract from large intestine to the mouth to reduce the inflammation. Address liver, spleen, gallbladder, lungs, and kidney. Address the nervous system, frontal and temporal headache, the neck reduced, eliminated, neck and shoulder pain, regulated endocrine system, and treated sinus. So very comprehensive, complex treatment that one can do with auricular medicine. So that's another reason that I like it. Okay, that I believe, whoops, come back. Um, so I would be giving a live demonstration, but we're online. <laughs> that was a picture at the 2012 conference, uh, and we're now at the end. So you can check out my website. When I'm teaching Dr. Huang's methods, she has eight levels. I really stick to her material, I stick to her teaching, um, and, when, and, and then when I teach my medicine, I teach the ways that I use auricular medicine and the ways that I do it, which is somewhat different. So I really have enjoyed uh, the presentation and I look forward to your questions. And um, I think I have to shut down now and then I will open back up um, to answer all of your questions. Yeah. yeah. Before before we go into that section, let me just ask a couple of the questions here, and then, sure. then we can maybe take some of the rest into that other session. Sure. Um, but uh, Angela's asking, do piercings influence the ear? Uh, repeat that. Do, do piercings influence the ear? Yes. Yes, they do. And, uh, and the body is miraculous, so the body finds ways around it, but if I had known then what I know now, I would not be wearing earrings and I would never pierce the ear, never. Thank you. Next question. Miriam is asking, um, what does a blood blister mean in the ear? Heat or uh, toxic heat? Uh, so, so, any, uh, so a person asks about a mole or a blood blister or uh, any kind of a growth, it can mean something or it can be nothing. I, and I don't mean to evade the question, but it depends on a lot else. It's sort of, in a sense, if you think of the tongue, uh, you would answer similarly. It, it, it depends on, there is no single sign that means this. Um, even a growth, even a growth on the ear. And uh, you know, if let's say that that growth, I showed you a picture of a growth on the cheek area. Uh, let's say that patient didn't have a tumor, um, but she had a growth on the cheek area. I would look on her cheek area and see, is there, is there evidence of any tumor there? No, huh? Well, sometimes you just have like a pimple on the ear and it doesn't mean anything except a pimple on the ear. So you have to take everything into context. So, okay, next Thank question. Stephanie is asking, do you treat the ear with seeds in the location where the pathology is manifesting? Oftentimes, yes, not always. Okay. Um, Pam is asking, some references say not to use needles in the ear in pregnancy. What are your thoughts on that idea? It really, um, it, it really depends on uh, on what you're treating. And uh, so if you're inexperienced, then the safer thing to do is no. But it, you know, um, it doesn't really, to say don't use needles in pregnancy is too 
too broad base. You know, there is so much that we can do in pregnancy that is not going to endanger the pregnancy, but and in fact, is going to uh, ameliorate it and, and going to help it. Okay. And then um, I think there's just one more before we switch over. Khalid is asking, are there any research papers uh, that look into the various conditions that are being treated? So you mentioned there was like a very large research base in China in the start. Were they looking at specific conditions as well? Um, so that large research base is in China and in Chinese. And um, uh, so I, I, can't, uh, I, can't, I can't point you in that direction, but Dr. Huang has, um, has facilitated research around the world. So I know there was a research center that she was overseeing in New York City um, and uh, in Brazil. So I mean, in other locations, I think in Canada, so there may be papers put out by those locations that I haven't looked into. So it would be worth looking up in PubMed and, and, uh, and, and researching because there very well might be at this point. Um, at the conferences that I attended, there were uh, doctors from all over the world and the majority of them are MDs who are also TCM practitioners. So many of them did publish papers so, um, yeah, I would look into it. At the conference, there were papers on, uh, on uh, using auricular medicine for kidney function and reducing dialysis use. There were papers on uh, di using auricular diagnosis to diagnose pancreatic cancer early so that there was, you know, if you don't get it early, it usually is a death sentence. And uh, by, by being able to diagnose it early, you can save people's lives. So th those are uh, papers that were published in Western medicine journals, I believe, in Taiwan. So I, I believe it's very much worth the search. Great. Well, uh, let's just, uh, you know, you, you I'm just going to stop your screen share there. Okay. And I just want to say that, uh, you know, many people are saying thank you in the chat. I'll share those with you afterwards. And uh, it was a very nice introduction. And I think you left a lot of people wanting to learn a lot more about this. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's time to get those courses up that we were talking about. Soon. And for those of you who are, who would like to find out when uh, Truthsayer releases some courses on Net of Knowledge or has another event, you can tune into her notifications by clicking on My Teachers in your Net of Knowledge account, uh, scrolling down to Truthsayer, and there's an option on that page to switch on your notifications. So we'll all switch over to the after gathering now. For those of you who haven't been in there, you just need to leave this okay, meeting. So I have to find the link and then switch over now, yeah. right? Yeah. So you I'm going that, to keep meeting. You have that link. So we all just exit out of this meeting, press uh, escape or, or press uh, leave meeting, and then. Okay.